I have mass at 10.30 in Middletown, so lest you all are worried because I haven't had mass with people in a long time, that I will keep you here for a very long time, as I am very well capable of doing. Let me tell you the same thing that Elizabeth Taylor, did you, do you know who Elizabeth Taylor is? Let me tell you the same thing that Elizabeth Taylor used to say to each and every one of her eight husbands. Don't worry, do not be afraid, I won't keep you long. <laughs> Today we meet a woman who has been married five times and the man she is with now, her number six, is not her husband. And the Bible says that Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Now, geographically, Jesus didn't have to. He could have gotten there by going around as normally Jews would do because Jews did not want to have anything to do with anything Samaritan. They were the hated other. You did not want to associate with anybody from Samaria. And yet the Bible says Jesus had to pass through there. He had to go to where the outsiders were, to where the Samaritans were. They were the outcasts, the hated other people. They were the marginalized people, the despised others, those who are looked at in the Bible as the enemy. For the Jews, the word Samaritan would be like saying today for an American, let's say the ISIS or the Taliban. Those were the Samaritans. They were the ones who intermarried with pagans and took on pagan customs. And they were believed to be the impure. And Jesus goes there. Now, he meets a woman. Strike one in biblical times. A woman. Women had no rights. They were just property. They were worth nothing without men. She goes to the well at noon by herself. Now, normally women went to get water together so they could chit-chat and catch up on the town gossip together in the morning before the sun would get up or before it was really hot. This is the desert. It's very hot there. But she is a sinful woman in the eyes of everybody around since she's had five husbands and now she's actually living with somebody that isn't her husband. She's on her sixth man as we hear. So nobody wants to associate with her. She is dirty for the people of that time. She is impure. You don't associate with sinners as you know if you read the Bible because you will catch what they have. People who were sick were thought to be sinful and you did not want to associate with them because you would catch what they have. That's why the disciples, when they come back and they see Jesus talking with her, they say, if he only knew what kind of a woman she is, he wouldn't be talking to her. You see, the religious and the very righteous people, the scribes and the Pharisees, would all not want any, to have anything to do with people such as the woman that we meet in the gospel today. She's at a well. Now, if you read the Bible, which I'm positive everybody here does all the time, just positive, you would know that the well in biblical times was a place to meet couples, where couples would meet each other. You'd meet your, your significant other there your husband or your wife, where the bridegroom meets the bride. In Genesis 24, Abraham's servant finds a wife for Isaac at a well, Rebekah. Genesis 29, Jacob's, Jacob meets Rachel at a well. Moses met his wife in Exodus chapter 2 at a well. So this is of great significance because the woman 
in today's reading is on man number six. You all know what is six in the Bible. Six, six, six. It is the number of the devil, the devil right? Number six is a, a biblical number for not being complete, for lacking something. So she's on number six. Who does she meet at the well? The bridegroom, who is Jesus, according to the Bible. And Jesus is number seven. That is a complete number. There is something missing in her life. She's lacking something. She is a six. And the number seven comes and fulfills her, completes her. Jesus fulfills all of her longing, which is why she says, I want this water always because I am thirsty. John's gospel tells us that Jesus comes for her, the outsider. He has come not just for her, but for all those who feel like they are incomplete, like they are lacking something. He has come for the outcast. She is his, and he has come to love her lavishly. You know, we like to be with our own kind, don't we? Republicans with Republicans. Democrats with Democrats. Just look at the situation in our world today. White people with white people. Hispanics with Hispanics. That's why a church like ours is very unusual. As we look around, we have... It's wonderful that we have everybody here from all sorts of backgrounds. You know, the growing churches in this country, in the United States, are evangelical white churches or evangelical Hispanic churches. Everybody likes to be in a mutual adoration society where everybody looks the same and thinks the same. But we are Catholic. Huh? You know... We are universal. I don't just want to hang out with my own kind. Faith is about trust. Faith is about trusting in God. Faith is about getting out of We're getting out of ourselves and going to, oh my God, this is, I'm so sorry, this page has got messed up, I should have marked them. I think I picked up the wrong pages. I'm so sorry. So Jesus comes to complete the woman. He goes after the other. Oh my God. This never happens. I had these printed and This is this. Oh. No. 
driving with a friend who honks and yells at the other drivers. No, this is not it. It's like the story of Bob who moved into a Catholic neighborhood and he was the only Protestant and OMG, the neighbors all decided to convert him and he agreed. So they took him to the priest uh, to get baptized and become Catholic. The priest poured water on him saying, you were born a Protestant, you were raised a Protestant, and now I declare you a Catholic. There you are now, okay? You're Catholic. Well, it was Lent. Like now. And comes Friday and OMG, OMG. Bob took the grill out and is grilling steak and having an ice cold brewski and the neighbors all have heart, all have heart attacks. Bob must have forgotten it's Friday in Lent. And they go over to Bob's house to tell him, and there Bob is standing with some water over the grill. And remember when he was uh, made a Catholic, he was donked. And Bob is standing over the grill and over the steak and says, pouring some water on, this, on the steak. You were born a cow, you were raised a cow, and now I declare you a fish. I guess I'm coming around here somehow. <laughs> the point of today's gospel is this, even though I got lost in, in um, I, send this, I send my homily this morning because I couldn't print it to Manny, and I guess it didn't, somehow you got the stuff mixed up or something, I don't know, <laughs> where, I, uh, where I have like different things in here. But the point is, no one is excluded. The church must preach the gospel in a way that proclaims that no one is excluded. And this doesn't, doesn't just apply to the other, but to me as well. The hated other in me is also included in the plan of salvation and in the plan of God's love. You who tell yourself, if I only lose weight, I will be lovable. Or if I only confess my sins and get my life together, I will be okay with God. If I only get my annulment, I will be okay. Or if I get married in the church, I will be okay. Or you say, if I lose weight, I will be okay. Well, you lose weight, something else will pop up like your double chin or your wrinkles or some other part of you will come to the forefront trying to make you believe that you need to change in order to be accepted and wanted and cherished and loved. God loves you the way you are, period. That's really the point of today's gospel reading that Jesus goes to the margins, to the people who are forgotten, who feel like they are excluded, and that God wants you the way you are. How many suicides are out there because people hate themselves? If you join a 12-step program, like Alcoholics Anonymous, you have to get up and say, I am so-and-so, whatever, and I'm Jimmy, and I'm an alcoholic, and I will always be an alcoholic. But I'm getting over it. You know, you're an alcoholic forever, right? But you're a recovering alcoholic. The bridegroom has come for you. Did you notice the seven? That's really the point that I was trying to make here. 
is that she's in number six. Man number six in her life. And Jesus is number seven. We are the church, the bride of Christ, the Bible tells us. The church is the bride of Christ. So we're supposed to be married to Jesus. He wants to marry you. He wants to complete you. Do you want, is that, I hope that this is making some sense to all of you. And so he's arriving when, when we feel excluded, when we feel alone, when we feel like nobody cares about us, like we, we've got nobody in our life for whatever reason, and he wants to complete you. He wants to be your number seven. To be with you and to claim you as you are. So this woman who felt dirty and ashamed, Jesus says what to her? Give me some water. He, God himself, the Holy One of Israel, touches the unclean. Remember, they were not supposed to have anything to do with Samaritans because you, you became ritually unclean. And this meant that by the law of the Jews that this uncleanness, this dirtiness that she carried was transferred over to him. Do you, do you get the significance of this? How powerful it is? That Jesus, by touching what she touches, takes on her uncleanness, her dirtiness, he takes upon himself. This dirtiness that she carried is now transferred to him. Hence the water here, the cleansing water to wash her clean. He washes her clean. That's why she says, how can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? You're not supposed to do this. That's my Jesus, you know, and I'm ending with this this morning. That's the Jesus that is in my life. Who touches the ritually unclean. Jesus becomes dirty so as to make us clean. Hence the cross. Like he touched the woman with the flow of the blood. He allowed her to touch him. She was unclean. He touches sick people spitting on their eyes. He even touches dead people like Lazarus. Remember that? There is no corner, no place, no cemetery, no margins where God is not willing to go for us. Even to Samaria, whatever Samaria you find yourself in. So the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. Do you all know chili con carne? Okay. Uh, that's the word incarnation. It's messy, isn't it? Like chili. It's a messy dish. God enters our messiness, our pandemic mess, our family mess, our marital mess, our sickness, our depression, our shame, our sinfulness, our addictions. God comes into the messy places of our lives. And he dwells among us. So he's there with you, whatever mess you find yourself in. Because we are all messy meat. We have messy families. I hate the term dysfunctional families. I can't stand that term. Because when you say dysfunctional families, that means that gives you the impression that there are some functional families. Every family is dysfunctional. Okay? I know. You know, yours isn't, e yours isn't any better either. We're all, I mean... 
He has come for the sick, not the healthy, as Jesus says, because the healthy don't need a doctor. So in the words of Pope Francis, we want a church that is bruised, battered, and dirty. A church that goes to the fringes, to Samaria. Okay? A church that isn't scandalized by the violation of rubrics, but a church that is scandalized by the millions of our brothers and sisters who live without love who are suicidal, depressed, anxious, lonely, and isolated. That's what should scandalize us. How many people live without the love of God? Not, you know, how we place the purificator on the, on the uh, chalice. Some people are... are Scandalized by that. Or, Father, so, such and such a lady is going to communion. She shouldn't be going to communion, Father. Why? Well, you know, she's living with so-and-so. And? So what that they're living with so-and-so? So, that, so what that she's living with so-and-so? Well, Father, but they're doing things together. And how do you know? You serve as a pillow in their bedroom? I mean, you know... Worry about your own behind. Stop being the person who's in church, you know, saying, Lord, instead of saying, Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. You say, Lord, my neighbor's not worthy to receive you. <laughs> You'd be surprised. So, it's a beautiful, beautiful gospel reading today that we have received from the Lord. And I'm so very happy uh, to see all of you here uh, this morning as we continue our uh, Lenten journey toward Easter. The only way we will be able to have a happy Easter is if we allow Jesus to find us. Like he, he wants to find us. It's not that we find God, but it's that God finds us. Remember, he went to Samaria. She didn't go to him. Okay? So stop worrying about your kids also who don't go to church and all the people in your life who may be away from faith. Jesus is after them. He's going into Samaria for them. Okay? Okay? Where whatever fringes or margins, wherever they find themselves in, God is there after them. He's always searching for all of us. That is the love of God in our life that we celebrate this morning as we stand and profess our faith.